Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our third webinar for the Oklahoma Airport System Plan Update. Um, I'm Grace Nardis, the director of the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission. Uh, with us today, we've got Barb Ritchie from uh, Javiation Woolpert. Um, Barb has been our project manager. For those that have attended these in the past, Barb's been our project manager on these um, webinars. and leading us to uh, figure out how our system of airports in Oklahoma can transition us into the next 10, 20, and 30 years. And what are some of those benchmarks that we need to hit in order to make sure we have a safe, successful, uh, efficient system of airports to meet the needs of air transportation, commerce, uh, and businesses across the state. So uh, without further ado, uh, Barb, I will let you get started if you want to go full screen. Thank you all yep. for attending today and uh, look forward to any Q&A here at the end of the presentation. Yeah, actually, um, today there is a lot of um, information. Um, OIC will be posting um, the slides uh, later today or for sure by tomorrow. But if you do have questions this morning, I think um, just because of the volume of the information that we're going to be going through, if you do have questions, please um, you know, you can submit those as, as we're going through the, uh, the slides. Um, I'm going to figure out how to get rid of us over here. Yeah, that's not it. Um, <clears throat> so if you've been with us uh, previously, as we've gone through the webinars on the system plan, um, the tasks that we've completed so far are the inventory, the forecast, <clears throat> the airport role assignment, which is the, uh, was the topic of the last webinar that we had. And today we're gonna to be talking about the system evaluation. The system evaluation is really um, the centerpiece, I'd say, of the airport system planning process because it helps us to identify the adequacies, the deficiencies, and also if there might be overlaps uh, within the existing airport system. It really helps us to set the final stage for uh, the recommendations that will come from the system planning process. As we discussed this morning, uh, we're gonna be talking a lot about system performance measures. And these are really characteristics of a good airport system. What does it take for the airports in Oklahoma to be able to meet the state's uh, transportation and uh, economic objectives? Uh, and in order to determine that, we use a series of benchmarks, uh, which we're, we'll be talking about, and then that helps us to uh, determine what is the current or the baseline uh, performance for Oklahoma uh, airports and the airport system. <clears throat> Once you have that baseline performance, then that helps you going forward to monitor how the system is changing as you make um, investment to address certain deficiencies. <clears throat> when you think about the system evaluation, I like to think of it, of course I'm showing my age here, um, when you actually used to get a report card, uh, especially in grade school, if you'll remember, <clears throat> you got graded in subjects maybe like math, social studies, uh, maybe you took a language or whatever. So the performance measures are the subjects that we're going to be grading <clears throat> into or you'll get, get the system will get a grade in. And then the benchmarks <clears throat> are the actual tests that are applied. Benchmarks are things that we can quantify, things that can be measured. And so that going forward, uh, OAC can continue to apply these tests and have um, information that shows how uh, their investment really helps to move the system um, forward. 
In the slides that you'll see today, we have a summary performance for all airports. And then we also uh, report on performance by um, airport role by benchmark. And just because of the sheer quantity of the information that's uh, contained in the system evaluation, <clears throat> we're just gonna be focusing in on overall performance for all airports rather than going through um, rule by rule for each benchmark. So it'd probably take us till this afternoon to, to get through all of those. So <clears throat> when you have the slideshow, if you're interested, you can drill down a little bit more and see uh, within each airport rule category how the system is performing. So the subjects, what are the performance measures? We're gonna be evaluating the uh, system to ensure that it's safe, to ensure that it's efficient, to assure, ensure that it's accessible, that it supports the economy, and that it meets user needs. So those are the performance measures uh, that we're using um, in this analysis, and those are the performance measures that we'll be talking about today. Uh, the first uh, performance measure is safety. And if you see here, uh, we have a list of six benchmarks that we use to evaluate all the airports in the system to see how they're currently uh, performing. Uh, things related to RPZs, RSAs, runway taxiway separation, jurisdictions with height zoning, uh, pavement condition index, and then clear approaches. So the first ben benchmark under safety was that we looked at was how are the airports controlling their RPCs? As you know, according to grant assurances, the airports really should have positive control either through fee simple ownership or through some sort of easement on all portions of their RPC. And if you look at the bar that's furthest to the left on the screen, that's the performance for all airports. So what we found, what we determined was that for all primary runways, currently 51% of the RPZs are fully under airport control. So that means about half. So the other half of the RPZs statewide are not fully under control. Now that might be small portions, could be large portions, but the airports do not control all the property currently in their RPZs. <clears throat> there are also actually um, maps that we've prepared um, to show this information and all of this data will become part of a really large uh, GIS database that we're currently working on that have the, the RPZ drawings so OAC can monitor um, changes in, in control over the RPZs over time. But um, that's one thing that really ideally we should see 100% on and over time we'd like to certainly see this bar increase in terms of positive control over the, the RPZs. Another thing that we looked at, and again, this is for the primary runway, was um, is the airport meeting the um, runway safety area uh, guidelines for FAA that are applicable to their uh, primary runway? Here with the report is a lot better. I'm not looking at the bar for this to the left. 91% of all the RSAs on the primary runways currently meet uh, standards. So that's that's a, a great uh, report card on that. We've got nine that are nine percent that are only partially compliant, and then there's one uh, one runway where we don't have compliance with an RSA on um, either end. So certainly we'll want to try to get that remaining ten percent into the positive category here. And when we move into the recommendations portion of the plan, those are the kinds of things that you'll see uh, as as being recommended. Another thing that we looked at was um, runway taxiway separations. Now, if an airport doesn't have a, pull, a full or a partial uh, parallel taxiway currently, then this uh, particular benchmark is not applicable to them. Uh, 59 um, of the 106 study airports that we measured for this particular benchmark have a uh, runway um, system that's supported by either a full or a partial uh, parallel taxiway. And for that, um, for, for those uh, airports, um, most of them, there, there's only one airport that doesn't currently meet um, the applicable uh, separation standards. So uh, going forward, um, you know, we'll, we'll have a recommendation that that uh, current uh, uh, 
uh, inadequate separation between the runway and taxiway at that airport, that that be resolved. And also as part of the recommendations, there'll be additional airports in the system that are recommended um, for the development of either a full or a partial parallel taxiway. And of course, we'll wanna see those developed to meet any applicable uh, FAA standards. Another thing that we looked at related to the safety benchmark was the jur jurisdictions that surround the airports that have some kind of height zoning uh, in place. Again, this goes back to your grant assurances. And um, in those grant assurances, there is an obligation that the airport be protected by some sort of height zoning or land use control. And what we found here was that for uh, the jurisdictions that are around uh, study airports, 78% of them currently have some kind of zoning in place that protects the airport from a, a height uh, zoning uh, standpoint so that uh, objects that penetrate uh, critical surfaces are not uh, penetrated by development. <clears throat> so again, this is something that we'd probably really like to see that far bar on the far left at 100%. So for those uh, airports that have jurisdictions that have not already adopted some kind of height zoning, those will be uh, identified in steps to bring uh, those jurisdictions uh, or have them adopt some kind of height zoning will be uh, included in the recommended plan. Uh, the last, I think this is the last benchmark uh, underneath the um, uh, safety scorecard. And that was for the pavement condition index, PCI, and this related, relates only to the primary um, runway. Generally, when pavement has a condition index of 70 or more, that signifies that the pavement is generally in good or better condition. So we looked at the uh, PCI uh, index for all of the primary runways in the state, and we found that currently 81% um, of the primary runways have a PCI of 70 or greater which indicates that they are currently in good shape. <clears throat> the PCI index is one of the hardest benchmarks to measure because this is a revolving door. <laughs> it's a merry-go-round. You know, one year, year your pa pavement may, may meet a PCI of 70. And <clears throat> if you have a lot of wear or tear, you have bad winters or, you know, a lot of aircraft that are too heavy landing on hot days, that condition can deteriorate even within the, the context of a year. So this is sort of a moving target, but this gives us a snapshot of where we are today. And certainly um, there are a lot of airports that have projects on the books to address any deficiencies that may have been identified. And if they don't, we'll be recommending those um, as part of the recommended plan. Um, oh, sorry, one more for clear approaches. Um, we also used um, <coughs> FAA data to look at all of the primary runways around the, the state because we felt at a minimum, there should be a clear 20 to one approach. Again, this is at a minimum <clears throat> to all primary runways on both ends. And what we found, and if you look at uh, the gray uh, section of the, the uh, bar on the far left, currently 49% of all of the uh, approaches to the primary runway are clear. Uh, within the state, so about 50%, about 29% have um, an obstruction at one end, and another 22% have a 20 to one obstruction on both ends of their primary runway. So again, these um, <coughs> obstructions that we identified in the 20 to one approach surfaces <coughs> will be called out um, in the study recommendations and um, something that airports should include in their next master plan or ALP update to address any obstructions that were identified. Again, a lot of these are vegetation related, so they do change. And this again is something that has to sort of be monitored on a continual basis because whatever we had with this reading will change the next time uh, that information is updated. <clears throat> the next um, performance measure that we looked at was efficiency. Um, how, how quickly can you get to uh, certain airports that exhibit certain types of facilities or uh, uh, things that are desirable, both from a, a, from a pilot standpoint? And in this uh, particular, or for this particular performance measures, the benchmarks that we looked at 
or airports with weather reporting, airports with a precision-like approach, so that would be LPV or greater, airports that have any kind of published approach, uh, airports that have an approach lighting system to their primary runway, airports that have a, what we um, analyzed in the six system plan as a good, better, or best approach, and then also airports that have um, VGSI that serve their um, primary runway. So for this, uh, these benchmarks in this um, particular uh, performance measures, you'll see that um, in addition to the graph that we had for the, the previous benchmarks, we also have a map showing uh, system accessibility to the various benchmarks that we're looking at. And um, the map of Oklahoma here that you see on the slide, these are 30 mile uh, uh, service areas for each of the airports. So what we found for on-site weather is that currently about 48% of all of the airports have some sort of on-site weather reporting equipment. But what that translates into is that almost 90, oh, well, it says 97, I think that should have been 96, probably my error. 96% uh, of um, all of the population in the state is within 30 miles or less of one or more system airports that have on-site um, weather reporting. And when we get into the system recommendations, um, and I, we talked about in the last web webinar that by airport role, we have recommendations for certain facilities and services that should be in place. So as it relates to on-site weather, uh, airports that are in the national business, uh, that are in the regional business, and some of the airports that are in the general category should have on-site weather reporting. So we'll be able to see when we get to the system recommendations if all of those airports are able to uh, achieve that, that type of object, objective for on-site weather reporting, and we'll be able to show how system um, performance for this uh, benchmark will improve uh, going forward. The next benchmark uh, in this uh, uh, performance measure relates to airports that have some sort of a precision-like approach. So this would be either an LPV approach or an ILS approach. And what we found, again, about half of the airports, 49%, have currently have uh, a precision-like approach, at least um, to one of the uh, ends of their primary runway. Uh, what this translates to in terms of uh, accessibility is that 94% of uh, Oklahoma's population is currently within 30 minutes or less of one or more airports that have um, uh, precision-like uh, approach currently. Again, um, there will be additional uh, airports in the system that are recommended to have this type of an approach. So when we get to the recommendations uh, section, we'll be able to see how that bar changes. You know, what's the target for system performance? And we'll also map how accessibility to this feature would uh, increase if all airports are able to meet their objectives for having uh, precision-like approach capabilities. <clears throat> when we go to airports that have any kind of published approach, currently 64% of all airports in the system have some type of a published approach, and that results in coverage of almost 97% of the state's uh, residents or population. Again, there are recommendations in the plan, or there will be, for additional airports to have published approaches. So we'll show how that bar uh, will uh, change if all airports meet their objectives, and if, in fact, that results in additional coverage uh, in terms of what's been uh, reported here. Uh, the next uh, benchmark that we looked at <clears throat> was airports that have an approach lighting system. <clears throat> this becomes a little bit more selective in terms of airports that really should or that, that need an approach uh, lighting system. In the uh, system plan, there are uh, objectives for all of the airports in the national business and regional business category to have uh, some type of an approach lighting system. So uh, right now, 23% of all of the airports have uh, a reported or reported some sort of an approach lighting system. Uh, on their primary runway. 
that uh, results in 84% of the population being within 30 minutes or less of an airport that has this particular uh, facility available. Um, and when we get to the recommendations, which are the, the next uh, step in the study, we'll see that um, bar where we have 23% of all airports having an approach lighting system, we'll have a recommendation for that to increase uh, slightly um, uh, because all airports in the national business in the regional business category should ideally be providing some kind of an approach lighting system on, their, on one or both ends of their primary runway. Um, the next um, benchmark that we looked at, and this was a little bit um, more detailed based on um, uh, visibilities um, and minimums uh, to, the, uh, to the airports in the system. And we did analysis to categorize uh, approaches as being good, better, or best using the criteria that you see um, here in the slide. There's really not an objective going forward to, um, you know, as to what percent of the airport should have a good, better, or best um, uh, approach. And this was something that OAC wanted to have data on so that they could see if there are any holes or gaps in the system in terms of where uh, good approaches um, are available. If you look at the attached or the, the map that we've got here on this particular slide, um, if it's an orange service area, that means using these cri the criteria that you saw on the previous slide, the approach was ranked as good. If you see the light blue, the approach was ra uh, rated as better. And then the dark blue show, those, show uh, those airport service areas that are currently ranked as having the best approach. Um, looking at the bar chart, um, and, um, that we've got here for all airports, which is the bar furthest to the left. Currently 36% of the airports have no approach. 25% um, have an approach that was ranked as good. 5% have an approach that was ranked as better. And 34% have an approach that was ranked as best. And 97% of the population is within the service area of an airport that has an approach, uh, one or more airports that has an approach that's at least rated as good. So this is information that OAC has so that they can see, you know, if there is a need to perhaps update uh, any approach in an area that doesn't have access to an approach that might be um, deemed better or best through this analysis. Uh, the last uh, benchmark then in, for this particular performance measures, measure relates to whether an airport has a VGSI um, on its primary runway. What we found here is that currently 64%, um, that's the 61 that's in the gray and the 3% that's in the green, have some sort of uh, VGSI either on one or both ends of their primary runway. Right now, 61% have it on both ends and another three on one end. And then the remaining 36% uh, of the airports have currently have no um, VGSI reported. Uh, when we get to the facility objectives, not all airports need to have VGSI, especially some of the smaller uh, less active com uh, community airports, airports that are in the community role, but there will be recommendations for additional airports to provide VGSI so that bar, in terms of the recommendations and the target that we're going for will change over time. But as you can see from the map, 97% of the state's population is currently within uh, 30 minutes or less of uh, one or more airports that do provide VGSI on their primary runway. Uh, the next uh, uh, performance measure then was system accessibility. And we looked at 30 mile accessibility to any system airport, 30 mile accessibility to any NIPIUS airport, 60 mile accessibility to an airport with commercial airline service, 90 mile accessibility to commercial airports that are served by uh, multiple carriers, 
30 mile accessibility to an airport that was in either the national or the regional business role um, from the previous assignments and then 30 mile accessibility to any airport in any role category that has a runway that's at least 5,000 feet long or longer. So this map shows accessibility to any system airport. And as you can see, uh, we've got pretty much of the state blanketed in terms of accessibility to one or more of the study airports. There are uh, a few areas of the state where there is no uh, airport or at least uh, accessibility within a 30 mile radius. But as you can see from, from this uh, map, 99% of all the population is currently served by uh, one or more of the system airports. So those airports that don't have any airport are very, very sparsely um, populated. We also looked at airport accessibility in terms of the airports that are included in the NIPIUS. That's the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems. And for an airport to get um, uh, access or to be, uh, in order for them to get uh, federal funding, um, they have to be uh, funding from the FAA. They need to be um, included um, in the uh, NIPIUS. So this is an important characteristic uh, for airports in Oklahoma. So for this particular measure, we looked at NIPIUS airports, not only in um, Oklahoma, but also in the surrounding states. And what we found was that when we look at just the Oklahoma airports, 98.5% um, of all residents are within a 30 mile service area of um, a NIPIUS airport. And when we um, uh, uh, also consider the nearby out-of-state airports, that increases slightly to about 99%. So that shows that you're getting a little bit of additional coverage from airports in neighboring states, but it's very uh, insignificant. So what, what this helps us to understand is that you have a strong uh, system of airports that are in the NIPIUS and those uh, airports are providing good accessibility for the vast majority of all the residents in the state. And we also looked at uh, access to um, airports that have commercial airline service. These uh, service areas that are shown on this map, again, we looked at the four commercial airports in Oklahoma. Uh, those are the blue ser service areas. And then we looked in the neighboring states to see where there were no nearby uh, commercial airports that might also be serving or could be serving um, Oklahoma uh, residents, either whether those be residents or visitors. Uh, from this uh, analysis, then we found that 83% uh, of all the population is within 60 minutes or less. Uh, of a commercial airport, whether that be a commercial airport that's in Oklahoma or one that's in um, a nearby state. Uh, typically FAA and in their guidance that they have, um, they indicate that you know, a 60 minute, a minute or 60 mile radius is, is typical for a commercial airport. But what we find is that when airports have um, multiple carriers, then people are typically willing to drive a little bit farther to get to that airport. So we also looked at a 90 mile uh, service area for airports, whether they be Oklahoma or airports in nearby states uh, that have uh, multiple uh, uh, carriers that serve the airport. And we, uh, again, we, we find that about 83% of uh, the population is within um, a 90 mile drive time of uh, one or more of these airports. Um, Oklahoma is one of the few states that's gotten a brand, uh, you know, an airport recently that didn't have uh, service in the, in the past. So that's, that's great news. And we're hopeful that as time goes by, uh, Lawton and Stillwater may um, secure additional carriers. And if they do, then um, accessibility to a commercial airport with uh, uh, that, that has one or more uh, carriers will be or could be increased significantly. So when we move into the recommendation system, we'll be able to provide um, OIC with data that shows how accessibility would improve if in fact uh, additional carriers were attracted to those uh, two airports that are now just single carrier facilities. 
Um, one of the other things that we looked at, and if you'll remember from the last web webinar that we had, we talked a lot about the role assignment process. And we have uh, airports assigned to four roles, national business, regional business, general, and community. So one of the things that we wanted to look at um, was accessibility to just those national uh, business and regional business airports. And if you look at the map, uh, the darker blue service areas are the national business, the lighter blue are the regional business. And when we look at the combined um, accessibility to those two categories or two roles of airports, um, just over 94% of all of the state is within a service area of one or more um, uh, of the national business or regional uh, business airports. So generally, um, good coverage for the, the, those two role categories. Um, another thing that we looked at was accessibility to a runway at an airport, regardless of a role that's 5,000 feet long or longer. Um, and we find that 94% of the population, when we consider both Oklahoma and um, airports that are in neighboring states, 94% uh, of the population is in uh, 30 minutes or, or 30 miles, excuse me, or less of one or more airports that have a 5,000 foot runway. As part of the recommendations from the plan, there are additional airports that ideally should have a runway that's 5,000 feet long or longer. So when we get to that recommendations uh, section, we'll be able to show how this coverage uh, would change if all airports are able to meet their runway length objectives that are established um, by the system plan. Uh, when we looked at, uh, at the performance measure that we called economic support, um, we did an analysis that's a little bit um, unique or different. You don't find this in every um, uh, airport system plan. But the National Business uh, Aviation Association that most um, <clears throat> larger corporations and companies uh, belong to, if they're operating uh, corporate jets, they, uh, a couple of years ago, published a set of guidelines <clears throat> that were uh, developed in concert with their membership. And what those guidelines do is they um, <clears throat> classify or identify characteristics of uh, airports that should uh, that are uh, ideally equipped or how they ideally should be equipped to, to accommodate heavy jets, medium jets, and light jets. And those um, are all determined by the, the maximum takeoff weight of the uh, aircraft that are operating. <clears throat> what, what, what we did was we used those NBA criteria then. We looked at all of the Oklahoma airports to determine if they meet the characteristics for being currently meet the characteristics for being able to accommodate heavy jets, medium jets, or light jets um, using these MBAA criteria. And then we looked to see if there were any uh, communities in the state that of at least uh, a population of 2,500 that are not within the 30 mile uh, radius of one of the um, uh, NBAA business ready airports. <clears throat> so in the analysis that we did, um, as I said, we broke it into three categories um, for, for business ready airports. One was heavy jets. We'll just look at the runway length because most of the other um, features are uh, similar to, uh, regardless of if it's heavy jets, medium jets or light jets. And for heavy jets, the minimum um, runway dimensions, according to the, again, this is according to the members of MBAA, that they wanted to see was a runway that was 5,500 feet long by 100 feet wide. For medium business jets, it steps down slightly, 5,000 feet by 100 feet. And then for light business jets, 4,000 feet by 75 feet. So when we looked at the characteristics of all of the Oklahoma airports, and then this is another um, benchmark that we also looked at airports in neighboring states to see if they were contributing in any way um, for this particular um, uh, category. We found that 95% um, of the uh, state's uh, population is within um, 30 minutes or, or excuse me, 30 miles or less of one or more of the airports that are classified as business ready, either heavy jet, medium jet, or light jet. 
when we move into the recommendations uh, section of the plan, and, and as we've talked about before, there are facility and service objectives that are established for airports in all of the four rule categories. And if airports in us, uh, particularly in the um, regional business and in, in the general category, if they're able to meet all of their objectives uh, that they don't currently meet right now, then this, um, there will be additional airports in the system that are um, business ready in terms of these uh, MBAA criteria that we use for this particular uh, evaluation. So when we go into the recommendation section, which is the next section of the plan, we'll be able to show OAC uh, how this would change, accessibility would change, and what additional airports would become business ready uh, according to FAA, or FAA, excuse me, according to MBAA, uh, if in fact um, all the airports meet all of their uh, facility and service objectives. Um, Oklahoma is uh, uh, very focused on making sure that the airport system is supporting the economy, is supporting the economic development opportunities of uh, communities around the state. So this is an important objective and when we look at the future, we want to see how, how accessibility uh, will improve if airports meet their uh, objective, objectives as they're, as they're identified in the system plan. Um, as I said, when we uh, looked at the beginning of this, that um, one of the things that we've looked at, and, and the, the map here shows the blue service areas are all Oklahoma airports that currently meet NBAA business ready characteristics characteristics, whether that be heavy, medium, or light jet. And then the gray service areas are neighboring airports in uh, nearby states that also meet those uh, characteristic characteristics, whether that be uh, heavy, medium, or light jet. Uh, we found that there are nine communities throughout Oklahoma, uh, and these has to have a, a minimum population of 2,500 that um, are beyond a 30 mile service area for a business ready airport. Those are listed here on the slide. Uh, Fairview, Watonga, Hominy, Cleveland, Eufaula, Stigler, Longtown, Longtown, Toka, and Frederick. But as you will see when we move into the recommendations section, as I said, if all airports meet their facility objectives that are in the system plan, then um, this coverage will grow and there'll be fewer communities that uh, will be beyond uh, those 30 mile uh, service areas for business ready airports. So this is an important part of, of the recommendation section. Um, the final benchmark that we looked at was how well um, does the system meet user needs? A lot of the benchmarks in this, uh, for this performance measure are more informational. They help um, OAC understand better what's going on at airports around the state. And as some of these benchmarks change, that could indicate that the airport is either growing or on the flip side, um, declining in terms of the level acti of activity that they have. So some of these are important indicators just for understanding what's going on in the system. Others are things that either the airport can respond to or OAC uh, can respond to uh, through investment if in fact there's a uh, significant or substantial uh, demand and justification for making those changes. Um, we looked uh, two of the benchmarks that we looked at here that are again are more informational in nature. Uh, what percent of the airports are regularly attended? Uh, in other words, they have uh, published hours when somebody's there on site at the airport. And then what percent of the airports have an on-site manager? And what we found uh, looking at that information is that 56%, just over half of the airports are regularly attended and that 44% have a manager that's on-site. Again, this is something that is only likely to change if activity at the airport changes. So either movement up or down for these two measures helps uh, OAC determine whether or not the airport uh, might be ready for a change to a more uh, a higher role in the system or conversely if activity is declining, um, possibly uh, uh, move down a notch in terms of the role category in the future. So these are, these are things that 
can just be monitored by OAC so that they have a better uh, handle on changes that are going on within the system. Um, another similar benchmark is what percent of the airports have some kind of FBO services. Currently uh, about half, 49% of the airports report having uh, FBO services, whether those might be provided through the uh, sponsor of the airport or whether they may be provided by um, some sort of a third party um, uh, company. Uh, FBO services, and we, I didn't really stop to point that out, but if, you, if we would go back to the slides where we showed the characteristics of the business ready airports, FBO services are something that NBAA members uh, want that they desire when they pick out which airports they're gonna use. So that, that was something that's important to the characteristics of a, a business uh, ready airport. So certainly going forward, um, we'll wanna, if it's possible to attract FBO services, that's in the interest uh, economically of the community. Um, another thing that we looked at in terms of the user services uh, uh, performance measure was whether or not the airport had fuel and we looked at both uh, 100 low lead and um, uh, jet fuel. And what we found was that um, over, just over 70% all of the airports have at least 100 low lead, 46%, not quite 50, have um, jet fuel. Uh, the objectives that we have by role do have recommendations or objectives um, depending upon what role the airport is. For, to have either uh, 100 low lead or to have jet fuel. So there will be targets for future uh, performance uh, as part of the recommendations. Uh, another thing we looked at was whether or not there was a um, general aviation terminal um, at the airport. Again, business users, um, if they're flying into an airport, they typically like to have a terminal uh, where they can do flight planning, they'd like to see uh, Wi-Fi services and other kinds of amenities within that terminal building. So we found that almost 70% of the airports, the study airports do currently have um, a, a general aviation terminal building. And as we move into the recommendation, there will be, um, a, uh, we will identify perhaps additional airports that should have a terminal. And even for some of those airports that currently have one, the need to possibly uh, provide expanded um, terminal, a terminal building in, either in terms of the footprint or the uh, services that are provided. Uh, another thing that we looked at in terms of user services was does the airport uh, currently have uh, any kind of uh, aircraft maintenance, whether that be major or uh, minor. Uh, currently, 56% uh, of the airports have no maintenance as shown in the um, bar that's furthest to the left, and 43% have some sort of aircraft maintenance, whether that be major or minor. Again, this is an important uh, uh, service uh, for business users, so this is something that we may want to see uh, ideally improve uh, in the future, but again, this is something that's beyond the control of uh, OAC. It's a demand-driven kind of service, so the airports will have to uh, grow uh, if we're going to see probably move much movement uh, in terms of how the system performs for this particular uh, benchmark. Uh, another thing that we looked at, and again, this was something that OAC wanted to know for their own um, uh, use and, and uh, understanding of the airport system, is how many of the airports currently um, support flight training. And that could either be flight training that's based at the airport or somebody that comes and visits and provides flight training on a transient basis. So what we found was about 48% of the airports currently support flight training, the other 52 do not. So this again is just another um, indicator that OAC can look at because if you're gaining flight training or that's growing, that could indicate that the airport um, activity is expanding, whereas if you lose, flight training services, that may mean that you're on a downward spiral. So again, these are things that uh, OAC could just look at in the future to determine if a, a role adjustment might be um, in line for a particular airport. So that's a lot of data, <laughs> a lot of information. And I think that you know if you're interested in this, the best thing to do would be when OAC gets the uh, slideshow online, you can take some more time and 
um, really drill down and see how, how uh, the airports are performing role by role for a lot of these benchmarks. Um, as I've mentioned, as we've gone through the, the slides this morning, that uh, there will be recommendations that come um, as part of the next chapter for uh, increasing performance for many of the benchmarks that we've looked at today. Um, some of the benchmarks, again, are just informational things to monitor, but many of them can be uh, impacted in terms of their improvement by investment uh, at the state, federal, and uh, local level. So we'll be uh, determining how that investment can really raise the bar uh, for, for future performance. So the next uh, webinar that we have probably um, sometime um, towards the end of September or the first part of August, Really, we'll be focused in on those uh, facility and service objectives. Uh, who, who doesn't have what today that they should have in order to, to best meet their role in the airport system? And we'll be looking at um, what we call the airport report cards, showing um, on an airport by airport basis what the airport should ideally have uh, versus what it currently has in place, and then identifying what projects are necessary um, to elevate the performance of the individual airport and then hence uh, also elevate the performance of, of the uh, airport system as a whole. Um, again, if you have any um, questions as we go through the system planning process or as if you, if when you have time to uh, give the presentation today a uh, more in-depth look, um, you know, please start with Nick. Um, he can answer those questions. If he needs to drag us in, he'll, he'll do that. But um, you know, as you can see from the, the data that we presented today, in terms of accessibility, the system is performing at a really high level already, but there are um, opportunities for improvement. There will be recommendations that, um, that we identify in the next step of the study. So uh, we're not gonna just call it good. <laughs> we're gonna continue to press forward and make sure that you know, when there are things that need to be improved, you know, to go back to the beginning when we talked about control over um, the RPCs, that's something that is important. So we'll want to have, um, you know, clearly identified in the plan which airports do need to take steps to control their RPCs um, down to, you know, things that, you know, more uh, esoteric things like, you know, who should ideally have FBO services or aircraft maintenance services so that um, a higher percentage of the airports uh, in the system are uh, business ready in accordance with those NBA, um, NBAA guidelines that we looked at. So that's where we are. Um, we're headed into um, the recommendations section and um, we do anticipate that um, sometime shortly after the first of the year, the plan will be um, uh, finished. We're um, gonna, um, uh, OAC is going to do some additional outreach for things that they need, and once that's completed and we have that that back, then we'll be able to really, um, you know, mesh together their information with the system plan recommendations to to come up with final uh, study recommendations for for each of the airports. So, uh, if anybody has any questions, be happy to go back to any slides that we showed or and answer those now. All right, not everybody at once. Let's yeah, not, really. <laughs> uh, let's, let's not let's not overwhelm Barb here. Uh, now is your time. You have uh, Barb, you have Nick, you have myself. Any uh, any questions based on today's presentation, or just anything about the uh, system plan update in general? I think we got one here in the chat box. Just popped up. Uh, Austin Wheeler. Uh, do we know how these benchmarks compare to neighboring states? Wondering where we stand as compared to other states in the region. Uh, uh, number one, big... top 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 of the top of the pack. No, uh, I, I don't yeah. know, Barb. Uh, I'll let you speak to that because I know you work in some other states. And yeah, I can probably give some information there too. Right. Um, you know that, that that's one thing that we find among states is they always want to know how how do they stack up to their neighbor or, <laughs> or other states and. Um, we do a lot of these system plans. I don't know. I've probably, in all the years that I've been in this business, probably done 40 or more. 
And I, the, the, one of the things that's difficult is that not everybody uses the same um, benchmarks and performance measures. For instance, we just uh, are wrapping up a system plan in Alabama. They had two measures, that was it, <laughs> that they looked at. So, it, you know, when you only have, when you have states that, you know, are not um, using the same metrics or the same measurements, yardsticks, whatever you want to call them, it's difficult to compare state to state. But I will tell you that, um, you know, those maps that we showed that showed system accessibility, um, I, I think we'd be hard pressed to find a lot of states that have, you know, because we probably showed, I don't know, 10, at least 10 or more different maps that show accessibility to certain features of your system, whether that's business ready airports, um, on site weather reporting, uh, precision like approaches. Uh, the system is very well developed um, uh, in, in terms of, of ha having airports that have those characteristics to the uh, resident population. But off the top of my head, I can't tell you, you know. You know what? What? How do you stack up to Colorado or Kansas for each of those factors or Texas? I I don't have that information on hand, and I'm not sure that we could even get it unless they've done you know a similar evaluation, which they may or they may not have. That's not a very good answer, <laughs> but it's the answer. Probably didn't tell you what you want to know. I'd say that that is the answer, um, and and I I would just say anecdotally, Oklahoma has stacked up pretty well. Uh, to its neighboring counterparts in terms of, um, I will say, customer service. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing that we see, and that's really not something you can measure in a system plan, but uh, we go out to trade shows, we go out to Oshkosh or NBAA uh, or AUVSI or any of these other shows, and the, the constant feedback I get is that our airport community treats everybody very well. Um, and, and that's not always the, that's not always the case in, in other states. So um, how we stack up to our neighbors, that's definitely something that we keep in the forefront of our minds. Uh, something we'll probably try and look at uh, as we complete this study and then we check out everybody else's studies. Um, you know, runway links, of course, you know, runway links kind of varies depending on your altitude. Our runway links are going to be completely different from those of New Mexico yeah. or Colorado yeah. uh, because of elevation needs. So. Um, but that's, that's definitely something we keep on the forefront of our mind at OAC is how do we stack up to other states in, in all these different metric areas. Uh, looks like Steve, <clears throat> Steve Saxon, another question. Is there a population or air traffic threshold that triggers the need for more NBAA business ready airports in any given region? It's a good question. Um. I don't know that there's a population threshold. Uh, the map that we showed, we, uh, I mean, uh, we uh, drew the line at a uh, population of 2,500. And what we found was that all Oklahoma communities that have a population of 2,500 or more, which is a fairly, um, you know, small community, are within um, a 30 mile service area of one or more of those airports that have NBAA uh, business ready characteristics that we used um, from the NBAA membership. And if all of the airports going to the next step of the study are able to meet their facility and service objectives that those several of those communities will also be within um, uh, uh, a service area of one of those NBAA business ready airports. So. I don't know that there's a, I mean, there's no magic formula for that. That was where we uh, drew the line 2,500 or, or, or more, because once you get beyond that, they're, they're pretty small communities. That doesn't mean that, you know, that doesn't mean that the airport that serves them doesn't serve business needs because, you know, one of the things that we find is no matter how small the airport and whether it meets all these characteristics or not, somebody's more than likely using the airport to serve their business. Um, you know, we wanted to have some kind of quantifiable measure that we could use to see how the system was performing related to this business ready uh, category. So NBA has those guidelines, we use those guidelines and, um, you know, we cut it off at 2500 in terms of the communities that we uh, looked at that should be in one of those uh, service areas. But there's nothing cast in concrete that that says that's what it should 
you know, has to be, could be something different. That's just what we used. Thank you, Barb. Um, yeah, I think the, uh, I don't know if there's a set population, but the, the air traffic threshold is really kind of driven by the, the use case scenarios. So if, if there's a business that moves into a region that needs a longer runway, and obviously we go into the conversation of justification for new runway links, um, that, that's part of the justification process for moving in uh, investment to get that runway length. Um, so those are the kinds of things that would trigger uh, needing new business ready airports in a region. Um, we're not just because this study comes out and this is something we've mentioned from the get go, uh, just because the study comes out and it may say, well, your, your airport needs 6,000 foot, 5,000 foot, 4,500 foot of runway length doesn't mean that it automatically becomes a let's go get that done. We still have to have a justified project and we still have to have the justification present at that specific airport to go make that federal and state investment uh, for those particular items. So this is kind of giving us the, the what should it be benchmark. And then we have to dive a little deeper into is there actual air traffic demand at that location uh, to, to need that kind of investment to extend that runway or to build a new runway. So yeah, I, I, that's a great point, um, because I think you look at the system plan as being, you know, objective, what's desirable, but in all cases, you have to have that actual demand or justification for it to be warranted and, and invested in. All right, any other questions? Going once, going twice. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you uh, thank you, everybody, for their time. Yes, thank you. Uh, great showing today. Appreciate all those of you that showed up. Uh, again, if there's a question you wanted to ask privately or if there's something that comes up in the next days or weeks, uh, feel free to reach out to uh, Mr. Nick there. You see his contact information on the screen. I will volunteer him his availability to, uh, to your all's uh, uh, due regard. Yes. Um, so please, please reach out to us. Ask us questions. Feel free to get involved. Thank you all for coming and uh, look forward to the, uh, the next one at the end of September, 1st of October. Thank you, Grayson. Have a good day, everybody.